and we will be um, posting this to the website a little bit later on as well. But again, thank you so much for being here and welcome to the Tribal Child Welfare Judicial Skills Training. This is hosted by our organization, the National American Indian Court Judges Association, and it's sponsored by KC Family Programs. And so very shortly, we're going to um, introduce our judge, um, Richard Lake. He is the president of our organization. And uh, Monica, go ahead and move into our um, next slide. And he's going to go ahead and give us a little bit of a welcome and uh, talk a little bit about NIJA and talk a little bit about um, our uh, past with Casey Family Programs and uh, the trainings that we have been able to bring to our judiciary um, and to our judges and with our state and tribal court judges in the past. So um, that being said, my name is Nikki Borshark Campbell. I am Paiute in Ute, originally from Cedar City, Utah. And I'm the executive director of the National American Indian Court Judges Association. And so that being said, I would love to um, turn this over to Judge Richard Blake so that um, Richard can also welcome you guys to this particular training. Um, Richard, go ahead. Richard, are you there? I am. Hang on one second. I can't start my video. Okay. Good morning. How are you doing, Judge? I'm doing great. Uh, it appears I'm having some technical difficulties over here with the uh, video portion of this. Uh, it's not allowing me to start the video for some reason. Um, but uh, with that being said, uh, again, on behalf of the National American Indian Court Judges Association, we'd like to welcome you to the Tribal Child Welfare uh, Judicial Skills Training. Um, hosted, as Nikki had said, by the National American Indian Court Judges Association and in, compliant, uh, in conjunction with the um, KC Family Programs. The NIJA organization and KC Families have been partnered for several years, and we have, um, we have um, co-presented on many, many uh, critical um, uh, child welfare issues, and we continue to bring those um, trainings to Indian country, either in person or now, um, with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic by, by webinar or by, um, by uh, video conferencing. It's, um, we've found that it's been challenging to, um, to do so, but um, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna make the best of this and hopefully the information that you're going to receive today is going to be uh, beneficial. The NIJA organization is uh, entering its 51st year as a, the only tribal judges association in a nation. And when you're talking about the, um, when you're talking about um, information, you're getting it directly from the bench as uh, the members of our organization, our members uh, sit, are, are sitting judges, retired judges, um, appellate judges uh, from across the nation in, in, in Indian country. Um, again, you're working with, uh, as I looked at the agenda, you're working with some phenomenal people. You're um, a, a wealth of information here and I look forward uh, to continuing the collaboration with the Casey Family um, Organization. On behalf of myself, my family, my people, I want to say um, happy holidays to each of and every one of you and please be safe. Back to you, Nikki. All right, thank you, Richard, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we know that you um, have an extremely busy docket, and so we are always happy to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so that being said, um, we have had a longstanding relationship with family programs, and uh, primarily we have been trying to educate our judiciaries, we've been educating our court staff, and really working with our tribes and our communities in order to promote, number one, our best practices, but then, of course, um, to, to assist in any way that we can to help our children and families have better outcomes. And through the years, and especially with the, um, the pandemic really disrupting how we operate normally, how we are 
working together collaboratively and really how we're developing um, these trainings, but also how our communities are providing services for our children and families. Um, we've evaluated that and we've really taken a shift for this particular virtual training. You know, normally we like to bring our judges to us. We like to have, you know, very in-person participatory type workshops with our folks, but we recognize that we have the opportunity to reach a lot more people with this particular type of training. So in looking at our best practices generally and looking at some of the best practices during the pandemic, we've really tried to shape something um, here with this particular training so that everybody can have a little bit of this, these best practices. So what we're learning as those of us who are working in the child welfare um, 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 practices is that um, there are additional uh, research that's informing how we do day-to-day -day business and that includes everything from our understanding um, of the adolescent brain, of uh, the um, adult brain. We're looking at the brain science. We are looking at how trauma affects our families and children. We're looking at how unresolved trauma is affecting our families intergenerationally. And we're also looking at, you know, the, the interventions that also help and assist with our judges to make these decisions. But um, understanding that we also know that these, um, these cutting edge type of research and training should be available to everybody who's working in all aspects of child welfare. So what we've been doing here in this particular training is we've really tried to shape it so that we're looking at what our judges need what lawyers also should know and keep an eye out for. But we're also looking at, you know, how can we bring in some more multidisciplinary specialized training to help you understand the work that you're doing, to help you understand children and to help you understand our families for better outcomes. So that being said, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Jack Trope of KC Family Programs to also introduce himself. All right, Jack. Um, good morning, Nikki. I'm having the same problem as Judge Blake. It's telling me I cannot start my video because the host has stopped it. So um, I can introduce, I will uh, introduce myself and Casey Family Programs quickly. Hopefully we can resolve it before the, the webinar starts. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, Casey Family Programs is, an, is a national foundation. Uh, we work in the area of child welfare across the country, uh, working with both uh, states and tribes uh, to um, uh, reduce the need for children to go into foster care, to improve the, how those systems function, to uh, keep families together and keep uh, uh, children safe and out of care whenever possible. Uh, our unit, uh, and um, my colleague Sherry and I will be doing the first presentation, our unit is the Indian Child Welfare Unit, and in our unit we work with uh, many tribes across the country uh, directly on child welfare issues, on related issues. We also work on uh, uh, promoting uh, uh, better compliance with the Indian Child Welfare Act, with uh, increasing tribal access to funding, uh, we work on issues around racism and equity and, and disparity and system disproportionality in, in uh, state systems. So, um, but our work is focused on, on Indian child welfare and on, uh, and on tribal programs. So we're very happy to be able to support NIJA and particularly to be able to support um, uh, something like this that's focused on uh, uh, the child welfare uh, uh, activities within your tribes. And so uh, we're glad to support it and um, hopefully we can share some information with you that you'll find useful. All right, thank you, Jack. Um, we are working on the camera issue right now. And so um, before we go ahead and begin our training, uh, Monica, do you wanna go ahead and go back to the slide about the, um, the door prizes? So, Nija is really interested in engaging with all of you. We are interested in knowing who you are, um, where are you joining us from, how are you doing, 
Um, where are you working from specifically? You know, let us know, are you, you know, in a home office? Are you sheltering in place or isolating? Like um, our staff has been since March. Are you in your office? Are you in your tribal offices? Um, let us know, let us know who you are, um, what you've been doing. But um, that being said, um, we also know that a lot of you are active on social media. So, you know, let us know that you're joining us and tag us and use the hashtag NIJA2020. Also throughout um, the next couple days, we have a variety of door prizes and we have a few things that are here. We also have NIJA branded notebooks and some t-shirts as well, but um, we will randomly be, be selecting winners from the people and the attendees who are attending us live. And um, we will follow up with you and get your addresses. So, you know, just make sure that you are on and that you're saying hello so that we can recognize you and hopefully you can get some of our NIJA door prizes. Um, of course, you can see here that we've had some donated from Reading Rancheria, where Judge Blake um, has worked. So um, absolutely, we're so happy to have you here with us. So keep um, saying hello. We love seeing you guys here in the chat. And that being said, I'm going to turn this over to Monica for a, um, a, a little bit of a walkthrough of the website. Good morning, everyone. My name is Monica, and I am going to walk you through the website. But first, I'd like to introduce myself. I am working with Nigel on the back end for some technical support, and I apologize about the video issue. Again, we're working on that right now. Um, Pam, I'm not sure if you want to turn on your microphone real quick and introduce yourself as well. Pam is going to be helping with tech today as well. Sure, and I can also see if I can start video, see if we can get this resolved. Can everybody see me? Yes. Yes. Cool. Hi, my name is Pam Goodwin, and I work at the Whitener Group, uh, and I work closely with Monica. We've done quite a few of these over the past several months. Uh, excuse my dogs. Um, and I am just going to be in the background helping you guys with tech support. Right now, we are working on uh, the video issue. So hopefully, we will have you guys 100% uh, up and running as each of you present. So I am really excited to work with you guys this week. Awesome. Thank you, Pam. And real quick, I'm just going to do some housekeeping in regards to tech. So you do have the chat feature. And like Nikki said, um, we'd really love to engage with you throughout the next couple of days. So feel free to use that chat function um, for general conversation, for comments, for introducing yourself, for chatting with other attendees as ever you, uh, in whichever way you please. And then there's also a Q&A function. You should see it on the bottom of your, um, of your Zoom toolbar. And in the Q&A function, you can write questions to the panelists. And at the end of each session, there is some allotted time for a Q&A session. So feel free to ask questions as we go along. And then the moderators will pull from that um, at the end of each session. There's also a raise hand feature. If you raise your hand, then Pam or I will message you and ask you if you need any assistance with technology. So we'll be using it in that way over the next two days. Hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at the <coughs> participant portal online. Um, I'm gonna pull up the participant portal now. So give me just a moment while I stop share screening. And I will pull up the website now. So you should be able to see it and you should be able to see me. So on the participant portal, it is password protected. And once you get there, you'll see that up along the top, there is an agenda by time zone um, up, up here. So no matter where you're joining us, you can follow along. And then there is also um, a detailed agenda. So today you would click on day one and you can join this Zoom room right here. So if you log out during a break, then you could click this to rejoin. And if you are to click any of the speaker's names, then you can read their full biography there. So that is just a quick walkthrough of the website. And I am now going to pull back up the PowerPoint so we can get rolling. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, 
I guess we'll start without uh, without the video, but um, we've got the slides and hopefully you can hear me. And so uh, we'll make do. Um, I don't know, Monica, are you uh, controlling the slide deck? Perhaps you can uh, move on to the first slide. Awesome. It's, it's up now, Jack, and we are going to make you a co-host. And once we make you a co-host, you'll have the option to turn on your camera. So just give us a moment to do that. Okay. And we will be able to get that rolling. Nikki, could you go ahead and make Jack a co-host? Jack, go ahead and start your presentation and I'll ping you when, um, when you've been assigned as a co-host. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. Um, if we could advance to the first slide. So um, I'm presuming that most of you and possibly all of you know uh, what the Indian Child Welfare Act is, but just in case uh, this is new to anybody, uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act is, is a federal law that was passed in 1978. Um, it pertains to uh, state systems, not to tribal systems. Uh, the relevant sections in the law that apply to, to tribes are a section that um, reaffirms uh, exclusive jurisdiction of tribes for children who are resident or domiciled on the reservation, and a section that provides for transfer of cases from uh, state court to tribal court. And um, we will talk more about that later. But in terms of the specific substantive requirements in the law, those are not applicable to, um, to tribal systems directly. However, um, we believe um, at Casey, and not just at Casey, I think a lot of people have, have come around to this point of view, that the Indian Child Welfare Act is the gold standard for child welfare practice. And so what we wanted to do this morning is just talk about, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the details in the Indian, Indian Child Welfare Act, just to illustrate what the, how those principles play out in practice. But the real reason that we're talking about this is to, is to talk about these principles as something that hopefully uh, you are uh, doing in your tribal courts or will consider doing in your tribal courts as a framework for thinking about uh, child welfare cases that come before your court. Now, obviously you are uh, governed by your tribal codes and you need to follow your tribal codes, but within every child welfare statute, there's a lot of room for uh, judges to um, uh, um, uh, use their uh, uh, wisdom and use you and and bring their perspective to how these child welfare cases are handled. And so this is where the principles that we're going to talk about today, hopefully, uh, will be helpful to you. Um, so this is uh, again just a graphic illustration of the child ICWA as the gold standard of child welfare. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what we mean when we say uh, that ICWA is the gold standard. First and foremost, and I, and I want to credit my colleague Sheldon Spotted Elk for some of these graphics. I'm not particularly good at graphics, so I borrow uh, many of his graphics. Some of you may know Sheldon. Um, but this graphic here, uh, I think, explains in a nutshell why we believe the Indian Child Welfare Act is the gold standard of child welfare, because first and foremost, it emphasizes keeping children with their families whenever possible, whenever it can be done safely. Um, secondly, keeping children connected with their relatives, with their larger, larger extended family network. And then finally, um, keeping children connected with their larger culture and their community. And we believe that this is best practice for all children, whether they're Indian children or, or non-Indian children, but we certainly believe that uh, it's highly relevant to um, 
how the child child welfare systems um, need to be treating um, uh, Indian children and families. Um, so now I'm going to sort of walk you through a little bit of the Indian Child Welfare Act, so you can see uh, wh why we think the principles uh, are what 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 they are. Uh, next slide. Jack, you should be able to turn on your video now. Go ahead and give it a try. Okay. Awesome. There we go. There we go. Okay. Well, I can see myself at least now. Um, okay. So, so again, so this the first principle we're talking about is emphasizing protecting the rights of, of biological parents and really the, the best interest of children by keeping them with their parents whenever possible. Um, so this is the first principle in the Indian Child Welfare Act, uh, and and by the way, this was in this this was put into federal law before a lot of the other federal laws that came into place that that talked about making efforts to keep children with families. So the Indian Child Welfare Act really was a groundbreaking piece of legislation uh, at the time. Uh, next slide. So here's some of the ways in which the law um, works to advance this principle. It requires active efforts to prevent the breakup of, of the Indian family, actually the Indian child's family, because it can be a non-Indian parent with an Indian child as well, and to reunify that family if a child's been removed. And so what the regulations tell us, what is, what is active efforts? It means affirmative, active, thorough, and timely efforts to keep the child with his or her family or to reunify the child if for safety reasons, the child has had to, been, had to be removed. Um, in the NHL Welfare Act, there's a higher legal standard uh, that has to be met. It's clear and convincing evidence for um, foster care placements beyond, uh, ter, um, beyond a reasonable doubt for termination, which is higher than most state statutes. So it provides that additional protection and parents can have input uh, into the placement of their children. That's recognized in, in the law. Now, next slide. Okay. So again, I wanna just give you an idea of what active efforts looks like because these are all things that um, that really can apply in your courtrooms um, be, uh, as, as ways to address families who come into contact with, with the child welfare system. So what does active efforts mean? It means assisting the parents or the custodians through the steps of the case plan. So it's actively working with the family to deal with whatever has brought them into the system or into contact with the system. Uh, done in partnership, well, with with the tribe. This is that's a direction for the state, uh, since, since you are clearly working with the tribe, but also with the child, the parents, extended family, um, bringing in extended family to support those parents and and bring that network of support around the family, um, documenting what kind of efforts are made, uh, so that that uh, you as a judge can ask uh, the state child welfare agency or the Tribal Child Welfare Agency, what have you done to, to keep this family together or what are you doing to reunify this family and to do it as early as possible. Uh, so that's what, what uh, ICWA requires, but as you can see, all of these things really um, are, are uh, ideas that, that would make sense within a tribal court uh, context. Uh, next slide. So here's some of the examples in the regulations of active efforts. And again, not all of these would apply necessarily in your courts, but to give you an idea in thinking about how can we keep families together? What kinds of things are out there that can be done? And again, uh, the NHL Welfare Act in the regulations provides a lot of, of good examples. Uh, assessing the family with a focus on safe reunification if the child's been removed, identifying services, helping parents overcome barriers, um, making a diligent search for extended family members. So you may have a child who's living with mom, but there may be a whole paternal side of the family that's out there that could be providing support here. So finding those, those people. Um, culturally appropriate preservation strategies. Again, a lot of this is targeted towards state systems. Um, next slide. Keeping siblings together. A regular visitation, 
as long as you can keep the child safe, regular visitation in a natural setting, identifying resources like housing, financial, transportation, mental health, substance abuse, peer support services, uh, monitoring progress, considering alternative ways to address the needs of the child's parent. So bringing in the community, bringing in uh, ceremonies, bringing in culture, bringing in um, um, elders, whatever may be appropriate. We don't need to be thinking only within the box in order to provide to support a family. We need to be thinking out of the box and particularly in tribal communities, there's so many different ways to uh, think about this that's different than the way the state system thinks about child welfare. And I know my colleague Sherry is really gonna go into that in, in greater detail when, in her part of the presentation. Um, next slide. So again, why do you keep children with their parents? I mean, it, maybe this is obvious to you and maybe it isn't, but, but it's worth remembering that um, it, by and large, children are better off if they stay with their parents or their custodians. It's traumatic to be removed from your, your parent or your custodian. And that's, that's even true if they're moved to a relative home, although it's certainly less traumatic to move a child to grandma's home than, than uh, somewhere else. But it's still traumatic to be moved away from um, uh, the people who have been taking care of you to, with your parents or your custodian. And, and the research shows us that most children want to retain connection with their parents, even when there are problems in the home. Um, and, and the children, and, and as they get older, they look for their parents, they seek out their parents. Now that's maybe not 100% true for every single child, but by and large, that's mostly true. And so maintaining that relationship all along the way, maintaining it whenever possible, uh, is is uh, in the best interest of a child. And so that's sort of our gold principle number one uh, that ICWA represents, but that we think is a, a principle applicable to all children um, everywhere. Um, next slide. So now the second principle is this idea of, of uh, if for some reason, or even if, whether a child's with his or her parents or custodian or not, that maintaining that connection with extended family, with relatives is vitally important to that child as well. And so we see in the Indian Child Welfare Act, this plays out in a number of ways. One is that the whole act of efforts we were just talking about includes that diligent search to find extended family members, to consult with them, to bring them in to support the family and provide additional structure for that family and for that child. Um, and extended family is play, our preferred placements for children if they have to be brought out of the placed out of the home. And I know that Sherry's going to talk quite a bit about when that may be appropriate. I know this afternoon she has a presentation on the safety guide, uh, which I think talks about uh, safety as the key component to look at in, in terms of questions of whether a child needs to be. Uh, uh, removed from a home. Uh, but in any event, if a child needs to be removed, um, the Indian Child Welfare Act says extended family is a preferred placement, relatives are preferred placement. And again, that's another best practice, another gold uh, standard for how we ought to be uh, treating children in the, in the, that come in contact with the child welfare system. Uh, next slide. So again, so just so that, that you understand how important this principle is in ICWA, I want to just talk, talk a little bit about there are only very limited exceptions in ICWA when a child shouldn't be placed with a relative. Um, one can be if a parent or child requests, but, but if they request in a knowing, deliberate way that they have valid reasons, maybe they have a neighbor who's not actually a relative, but who the child has a relationship with, something like that. Uh, keeping siblings together, some kind of very specialized need like certain medical treatment, or if a preferred placement, if a, if a relative can't be found or other preferred placement after a diligent search, right? So except for those circumstances, ICWA says the child should be with a parent, with an extended family member uh, whenever the child needs to be removed. So again, that's for us best practice, gold standard. We know in a lot of tribes, this is something that's, that's routinely done. Um, a lot of the children who are removed are placed within families. So uh, 
totally understand that this is something that many of you routinely do. But just to want to reemphasize how important that is and how that's really a best practice and a, and a gold standard. Um, and you know, in the uh, in the guidelines, stick, where they even talk about if for some reason a child needs to be placed in a non-preferred placement, let's say that there are no relatives close by, and you're trying to reunify the child with a, with a family, but there is a relative further away that at some point might take the child if for some reason the parent is unable to to, to parent that child long term. Um, and the talk, and, and what the guidelines talk about is strengthening those bonds between the child and the extended family, even while the child's in that non-preferred placement, so that if the child needs a permanent placement other than a parent, um, that family member has a relationship with the child, those bonds are there, and the child can, over the long term, be um, within that, that preferred um, placement. Next slide. So again, what are the reasons to maintain connections with the extended family? Maybe a lot of this is obvious, but I think it's worth uh, reemphasizing. First of all, we, we, know, we know that children who are placed with relatives have fewer placements. They're not moved around from home to home to home. And they're more likely to safely reunify with the parents because of that relationship between the parent and the, the extended family. Um, when you place a child with extended family, um, that, that's, a, that's what we call relational permanence. In other words, grandma is always grandma. And so that's a permanent relationship, regardless of what label you put on it, regardless of whether you call it a guardianship, regardless of whether it's an adoption, it's still a permanent relationship. And so when you put a child in an extended family placement, that's a relationship that's there forever, regardless of what you do on the legal end of that. And so that's really important. Um, extended family placements keep children in an environment with people they know, hopefully people who they love and who love them. Um, and by putting child in an extended family, you're maintaining continuity in that child's life. And when you think about the disruptive of, uh, the disruption to a child's life, if a child is taken away from a parent or a custodian, um, that continuity is really important to that child's mental health, emotional, social development, and the, the child's entire sense of well-being. So, so again, those are all the reasons why uh, our, our second gold standard principle is maintaining that connection with relatives, with extended family, because again, it's, it's the best for, for children who are at risk. Um, next slide. And then the last um, part of our gold standard um, uh, three pack here uh, is keeping that connection with the, tri with the tribal community and culture. Um, so in the Indian Child Welfare Act, uh, after extended family, you have preferences for tribal foster homes tribal families, other Indian families. The tribe is allowed to set its own placement preferences, which apply in state court. Um, same with adoption placement preferences. The tribe can set those preferences. It supplies in state court. So again, it, it's that tribal connection, tribal empowerment and connection between the child and community and culture that's emphasized. Um, the social and cultural standards of the Indian community are supposed to be applied in state court, including testimony from qualified expert witnesses. What's a qualified expert witness? It's someone who's generally knowledgeable about your culture and the child rearing practices in, in the child's tribal community, right? And so again, in all these ways, the Indian Child Welfare Act tries to emphasize keeping the child connected with community, trying to keep the child connected with culture. Next slide. And again, the tribe's rights in ICWA are another way to keep that child connected, right? So it's so the tribal rights under ICWA have a couple of parts to them. One is the exercise of inherent tribal sovereignty, which we all understand and we know and we know how important that is. But the other reason tribes are of that the act recognizes the, the right of tribes to be involved in these state cases is because it's a way to ensure input from and involvement with the child's community. Again keeping the child connected. So tribes get notice, they have the right to intervene in, in, in any case involving uh, a, a child who's a member eligible uh, or, and, and a child of a member. Um, right to have the case transferred to the tribal court unless a parent objects 
where there's good, the state court finds good cause, and that's supposed to be an extremely narrow exception, uh, the good cause exception. Um, and, and again, as I mentioned, the act re-recognizes this, the pre-existing exclusive jurisdiction over children who are resident or domiciled on the reservation. So all of these are rights that are not only sovereign rights, but they're a way to ensure that the child remains connected with his or her culture and community. Uh, next slide. So again, why is this important? Uh, and again, this may be obvious to many of you, but um, we're stating. So we know that studies show us that um, culture is connected with resilience, particularly in teens, and that a cultural connection is critical for a child's sense of identity. That preserving a child's connection with, with culture and community also pres preserves a connection uh, with caring adults in familiar settings. So again, promoting that kind of stability and support that the child needs. Um, stability is key for children if they have to be removed from, from families, and we hope that happens as, as infrequently as possible. And this includes a continuity of schools, uh, providers that they may go to for services, participation in community events, cultural events, religious activities, sporting events, whole th all these things that matter in a child's life, keeping them connected with community and culture. Uh, provides them with access to all of these things. And research shows that, that tribal involvement in uh, ICWA cases themselves increases the rates of reunification with parents and shortens time to permanency. So you can see that involvement of the tribe, that input from the tribe and the tribal community and that perspective um, is, is helping children, Indian children in state cases to reunify with parents and to, uh, to be back in a permanent setting uh, more quickly. So those are all reasons that, that uh, maintaining those connections are important. Uh, next slide. So again, we know, so, so this involvement of tribal community or, or community goes beyond simply um, the formal institutions or can go beyond the formal institutions of the social worker, the tribal judge, and, and that kind of thing. That in the larger child welfare system, one of the things that a lot of, there's a lot of discussion around, how do we make this more of a community driven um, uh, system? How do we make this a system where the community steps forward to help the family rather than the judicial system comes in and because provides a punitive uh, sanction against the family. So there's a lot of discussion about how do we get kids out of that punitive system and into a, a more a system that's more supportive, that's community based, uh, and that we're removing child and putting them in the child welfare system as the last resort. And that for most kids, those sorts of community supports and community services uh, are a better option. And so we know in some uh, in some, uh, it's some tribal communities, these things are happening. And that these things really, in many ways, go back to a much more uh, traditional way of thinking about uh, child welfare issues. So, so, so uh, the development of uh, what I'll call non-adversarial processes that involve community members in court proceedings. Uh, so it's not just this Western uh, adversarial model. These are our models. And I know you're going to have a presentation, I think, tomorrow on at least one of these models, I believe. Uh, these processes that are being developed to, to become more collaborative, get the community at large involved, and not just um, you know, the, the social worker and the attorney and the, the, um, the family. And so here's a few examples of courts in different um, uh, uh, the tribes are, are using healing to wellness courts, which some of you may know about, uh, courts based on restorative uh, justice principles, uh, peacemaking courts. Uh, these are all examples of, of tribal communities who are really attempting to take that last gold standard principle of uh, connection of the child with culture and community and bring it right into the, the, uh, the court system. Um, so with that, I'm going to, I believe that's my last slide, but can you go to the next one, perhaps, to... No, to let's just sure? leave it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right, you can go back then. So, Thank you. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Sherry Fremont, who I think is going to really expand on 
um, uh, why you don't want to emulate state systems so much, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry? Thank you, Jack. Good morning, everyone. Sherry Fremont. I'm in Denver, Colorado today in my basement. <laughs> um, I'm a member of the Turtle, Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa. I'm also Omaha and Seneca. I live with my father and my auntie, my dad's sister, who helps me raise my children. Um, my husband and my two kids, we all live in our house, sharing the parental responsibilities and the uh, elder care in our home, as has always been the way I've lived. Uh, so I, I put that forward as it kind of frames the space that I'm coming to you from today, since we're now doing everything from, well, at least where I am, we're doing everything from our home, parenting, school, work. Um, and what I've been doing, a lot of thinking, a lot of thinking about how we're doing child welfare um, around the nation. I've been with Casey for five years. Prior to that, I was a tribe in Arizona for 10 years where I was the chief prosecutor doing dependency and criminal practice. Um, and before that, I was a stateside prosecutor um, doing child abuse cases. And um, so it's been a long journey for me as to how I understand what and how we do the business of helping serving families in need. So, um, I would put out, of course, I'm a bicultural person. My mom's family is white. I was raised in Portland, Oregon. So I'm a, an urban Indian. Um, so I think all of these things shape my perspective. I've been exposed to, um, you know, families in the tribal networks now, um, not only from my direct practice, but also I still have family in both of my tribal communities that unfortunately have had contact with the tribal systems. Um, and just kind of putting it all together in some ways and I'm still trying to think it out. So I hope we can do some thinking together today on some of these ways. Um, Jack, you're not on mute, just so you know. Um, the first thing I would like to do in the chat as I, as I go through this a little bit, I would like us all to think about when you were becoming a person Right. So you entered the world one day, you know, and for all of us, we have those as maybe longer than others. And as you developed into the human being that you are today, and I acknowledge we're still developing, but in your childhood, who influenced who you became today? Who guided you to your adulthood? Who, who guided your development of self? Who helped you be a good relative? So if you want, I would appreciate it if anybody would just want to put some thoughts in the chats about who those people are. All right. All right. I'm ready for my first slide. This is um, something that I've been reflecting on for a while. Uh, for my tribal people, you know that we sometimes um, have a difficult understanding of what it means to be native, what it means to be traditional, what it means to be a good relative. And this is my great grandfather, Wajepa, his, um, his white name was Ezra Fremont. And at some point, um, my grandfather was asked, uh, his children were taken to Carlisle and he, they, somebody asked him how he processed this. How did he deal with the transition? Because he originally reset, resisted colonization and contact with white settlers. He, um, but my grandfather said, somebody said, how do you, how do you accept that your children are um, going to these schools and wearing white man's clothes? And my great grandfather said, well, I look to the future. I can sleep easy if I die, if my children are prepared to meet the struggle that is coming when they must cope with the white settlers. So I think about this because um, we always put a lot of judgment on the values that we give people. But for me, this was a little bit of uh, freeing because I'm several generations behind him and feeling a lot of pressure to make sure my children knows what it means to be indigenous, what it means to be tribal from our tribes, what it means to be a Manhan, what it means to be Ojibwe. Like, and, um, but he knew that a lot of this was beyond what you know, he knew that there was a lot going on. And so he wanted us as all um, parents of, I would say every species wants, right? It's the most natural thing inside us is to want our children to be able to be safe and to be able to, uh, to just live. I mean, he didn't say he wanted them to thrive. He wasn't saying he wanted anybody to lose their culture. I don't think he knew what was really fully coming, but 
he wanted us to survive. He wanted us to be safe. This is in the time of the Indian massacres. Um, and when they were, you know, language was taken from us, traditions were taken from us, and we were even taken away from our dress and our dance, etc. So I reflect back on this as we have come through this journey, and some of us are working on uh, reclaiming or re-engaging with traditions and values. One thing they weren't able to take was our values, right? Um, they it, It's sneaking in in ways that has continued to sneak in in ways, but we are family people. We are clans and we, I'm gonna go through the chat here and a lot and look at some of the answers we got. We got aunties, cousins, parents, grandmother, grandmother, aunties, uh, relatives, community, school and friends, my siblings, grandparents, teachers, my mother, my grandparents. So um, hardly anyone put just their parent. And I think that that's the fundamental way that in tribal values in, in most, I know we're all very different, but we are not as closely related to the concept of a nuclear family as Western society. They, I'm sorry, well, I, I, I'm gonna refer to the federal and the state governments as they. <laughs> so they worked really hard to have us assimilate. So, you know, when they put us in boarding school, it was very clear that they wanted us to succeed. They wanted us to allegedly um, find a better way to be nuclear families, wear white clothes, be Christian, uh, be capitalists, right? Be workers, be farmers, and leave all the things that are Indian behind. And um, they thought that, you know, I guess they thought that that was the best way. And I think in a lot of ways, we're finally starting to see the larger population, the Western perspective, isn't always, um, it didn't turn out so great, right? So, um, we need human beings. I think in this pandemic, we can see we need our people. We need our people. And I don't want my children to grow up only knowing me and their father as their guiding um, influences. I want my children to know their aunties, their grandparents. Like the fact that my children see their grandfather every day is a blessing that I can't put enough weight to. So the first thing I would mention about tribal practice and why it's different is one of the fundamental foundations of child welfare in the States is that it's a relationship from a parent to child, parent to child. And it does not relate in the way of children to their child and community, except for maybe ICWA. So outside of the ICWA Act, right, the first repara reparative statute that we had, um, white values, Western values were parents are in control of their children. Parents are in the, and by and large, that's relatively true, but it miss, it, it doesn't connect. It didn't latch well with the, our idea that we are communal people. Our children were born to not just their moms and dads, but to their ancestors, to their grandparents, to their clans, um, to their siblings. My siblings were a critical piece of who I am today. I take my role as a sister seriously. And so all of these familiar relationships that we have are fundamental to who we are and our values, but it is not recognized in the Western perspective. It is in some ways starting to, in the sense that ICWA was the first one that really put a, a requirement about putting kids with their own family. Um, that is now the standard pretty much everywhere, but it, always, it wasn't necessarily, right? And so basic. A child should not lose their whole family because their parents are sick and hurting. They're, a child should not lose all of their connections because their parents have succumbed to substance abuse from a long history of depression and trauma and all these other things. So if we as tribes can focus on what does the child deserve? And so I guess we can take that principle of ICWA and maybe remember that ICWA was done in consultation with a lot of tribes talking about what our value is. And remember that tribal values influenced ICWA. What does the child deserve? Why does the child deserves our communities, right? Like the, and I, I don't mean to be uh, <laughs> exaggerate, they meant for us not to be here and we are, but when our children are taken um, by standards that are not our own, we continue to lose our 
um, communities. Um, you know, there's almost a half, a, what is it, a half a million children in foster care in the United States. Um, for tribal children, we are in, we are on rates of care beyond what it, for white children and other children. Uh, in many cases, similar to how we treat black families, but in some not. In states like uh, Alaska and Minnesota, the rate of children in care is abysmal, taken from their families, taken from their parents, right? It's become very normalized. I would say in um, tribes that I've worked with, it, these kinds of things are very normalized. We're very angry, we're very emotional about the despair and the pain that our parents are struggling with, our, our, our parents and their ability to parent. So um, I just like to open a little bit with that to talk about um, why we don't wanna be, remember that ICWA was to put a restraint, was to stem the tide of decimating tribal communities, right? Um, so yes, it's the best thing we have, but the child welfare system is by and large very detrimental to children and families. Um, I hope that inside tribal communities, we can be better. I know we are better. <laughs> I know that we know that we value the whole family. I know that we value children and that we don't just disregard parents when we're angry and frustrated at their brokenness. I know we're frustrated by their brokenness. I know we are emotionally upset and out of options sometimes, but we still love them. One distinction I've noticed from my state practice to my tribal practice is with very limited exception, we have love and forgiveness and compassion for our people, even as they suffer and cannot meet the daily needs of their children's lives and most importantly, probably to their own lives. I don't think we were meant to do this alone as people. Next slide. So, how do tribal courts and ICWA fit? Well, I would say tribal first um, is, you know, the, we can have the option when we, when our tribes do have child welfare courts, we can have the oppor um, opportunity to bring those cases back to community if we choose to. This comes up not as often as I um, thought because many of our tribes who end up in this, many, depending on the state uh, where you are, um, sometimes the people are far away from their tribal courts, right? So I don't live very near my reservations and I never have. So it wouldn't have been very likely that my, I would have been transferred to tribal court for anybody who might be from North Dakota or any of the tribes that were relocated to the West Coast or to even to Denver. A lot of our people are living on the West Coast or, you know, on the West, um, not near our tribal communities because of situations and so transfer isn't always available or um so but in other states where we have a lot of our community members living nearby it's a common practice and um i think they see a value shift some of the intentional questions we can see uh i uh, considerations right when to transfer when to say yes when to say no it's very rare i've seen no's on behalf of the tribe and it's usually done in consultation with the department about what, how they're able to meet the capacity of the needs of the child typically, such as a child who's um, getting medically treated and the expense of that is gonna be very difficult to achieve through the tribal processes. Because when a case transfers, we don't necessarily um, have access to the same services and programs for children in state care. Um, some tribes have been able to negotiate that some of those things do continue, but in some places we don't. Um, I think another significant piece here is, is, but we should really consider is how are we treating the extended family? One thing that really is uh, painful to me is how frequently tribal families are not permitted as placement in state systems where in tribal they likely would have been. One of my aunties is raising six of her grandchildren right now. Um, and the parents are all around. It's an informal care. Um, the parents are around, they visit. I would call it more of a communal scenario, not unfamiliar probably to most of us. Um, she would never be approved through a state system. <laughs> I know she wouldn't. Her home is not up to state standards, but those children receive love and guidance and protection and safety and identity every day. And 
I think in tribal courts, we recognize that. State courts typically still wanna see um, socioeconomic standards that fit their values. And so we need to be really attentive to that and put the weight on that. Um, one of my favorite words is love and the idea that love isn't in very many tribal, I mean, state codes. It is showing up in tribal law. How do you measure love, right? Should it be measured? I say absolutely, but um, it isn't in state court. They call it attachment. <laughs> they call it bonding. Um, I like us to think about how are we teaching these children to be a good relative? How are we helping the parents heal as a family in community? Um, so thinking about can we do that if we bring them back to the tribal court? The other piece is um, I, there are tribes that say no matter what, bring these cases home. Um, that is a, a passionate and an emotional response um, that might have really good intentions, but it can have be very difficult um, in the sense that there are people sometimes that might be states away. And we need to honor the fact, like in people who like me, who was once a child, um, I had strong family members that were not tribal too, and um, were a part of my extended community that helped me um, get across the, the adulthood line, right? So we, 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 we need to be attentive to who is the supportive network for the family that we're talking about. So sometimes um, those considerations, I think leadership is really important here. I think elected leaders need to be aware. They're the ones who get to um, often speak with the state lawmakers and um, they decide our budgets, right? They decide how much money the courts are gonna get, um, how much money the departments are going to get, and they get to write the laws. So I think one of our important pieces here as the from the judiciary side is how are we engaging with what, how our laws don't match what we want to happen or what the community wants to happen. I've seen a million tribal codes, <laughs> not a million, but at least a hundred. And, um, a lot of them look like states, and I know that's not what we intended, especially as it relates to parental rights. I'm gonna talk about that later on today. If you if you tune in in our safety summit, I mean our safety discussion later, I'm gonna talk a lot about um, how the tribal view of parental rights doesn't match what children deserve. Next slide. Um, I'm just wanting to make sure that I'm not missing any important comments because you please comment in here as I'm going along because I we aren't in person, unfortunately, and there are some really uh, well-versed members of our community online today who have important comments to share and I wanna lift those up and develop them a little bit. So um, somebody was, someone just wrote here, you know, foster parent certification through the state is just, it's, foster parents financially on the reservation. We need to certify fosters on the reservation so they can get the state perks and financial assistance. This helps fosters to give love. Agreed. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about licensing family members. I wish that we could give families the perks and the financial assistance without having to give them a license because I was born an auntie <laughs> and I am a little, it, 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 it gives me a little bit of stomach ache to think about the state of Colorado or the state of Oregon or the state of North Dakota telling me how to be a safe relative. And so that piece bothers me, but I absolutely wish that all of our kin care providers had the financial support they deserve, the um, therapeutic support they deserve. And um, I wish we could elevate them and support them as much as they need. I just wish it didn't have to be tied to licensing. Tribes that do licensing um, open it up a little bit more, um, but I just really wish, I hope that we spend some time thinking about that as we go back to our communities as to how can we support kin care providers without being held to the federal rules of licensing and how to get funding to people. Um, I know some tribes have been really creative about it. I would turn to Salt River as one um, that I know has been able to support kin without having to go through the licensing process. But of course they had uh, funding streams that allowed them to do that where most of us do not. Um, tribal court doesn't- Sherry, if I, if I could just add well, something real quickly though, if your tribe is licensing the homes, they should be able to get, the, the, that should be good enough. 
they shouldn't have to go through the state. So I just wanted to throw that out. And I agree with what Sherry said that that not licensing at all ought to be an option for, and, and uh, not a, should not be a, a bar to financial support, but um, state licensing is not a prerequisite in most cases either. So so I'm right. say that explicitly. That's right. Um, just so you know, Jack and I at KC are available to talk this out if anybody wants to talk about it in a deeper level. Um, we're quite passionate about it. It's important to help our, um, if we can't support kin, we're gonna lose children to stranger foster care. And, um, and so the harm that is coming from that in the long term, in the aggregate all together, not, not necessarily one by one by one by one, <laughs> um, is devastating. So we have to find a way to support kin. So one of the biggest differences in tribal court is constitutional application. So for my judges on the phone, um, I mean, on the, on the call, on the, on the webinar here, keep in mind that the United States Constitution and its interpretation is not automatically applied to tribal cases. The Constitution applies through the Indian uh, Civil Rights Act, which holds up some of the pieces, but we have a right to our own tribal interpretation before we, a tribe, we apply what's already been decided. And I bring that up primarily around parental rights and the idea of um, who's entitled to a child. And I was wrong about this in the past, and it was easier to just follow state's jurisprudence on what the rights of grandparents were. Because um, there was a case that came out when I was law school and I realized, wow, United States law doesn't fit with my tribal values. And um, I keep continuing to be shown that <laughs> as cases keep coming down, uh, with the exception of some great Indian cases we've had in the last couple, you know. But with related to parenting, there was a case called Troxel and it said, unless you can show a parent is hurting their child, is unfit, um, the courts won't force a kid to see their grandparents. And maybe that's okay. Maybe that is a good standard, but it kind of, the it kind of went too far and it kind of undid the concept of, per, of grandparents' rights. And I think in tribal courts, if we don't look at our tribal statutes and if we did a practice that um, somebody I admire greatly out of um, the University of Victoria in British Columbia does, is she helps us look at stories and helps us identify our values and our values should be law. Our values should be law. And she would say, Let's go through all of our tribal stories and say, what is the right of a grandparent? What is a right of a child to a grandparent? And does it fit this case called Troxel out of the United States Constitution? And I would say absolutely doesn't. And so I think if we used her practice, her name is Val Manuel out of um, the University of Victoria, you should look her up. Um, she would help us identify that the relationship of a child and grandparents and extended family and, and likewise needs to be better captured in our tribal laws. I mean, it wasn't our practice to put these in written writing and, and go to court and have a, a adversarial process of one to the other anyway. But if we're gonna do that, make sure it's principled on tribal values. And I, I've been involved in tribal code writing when I was uh, particularly around domestic violence and, um, and some of the well, child welfare too. And, we missed this connection, we really missed it. And I think we need help in identifying how to bring those two. So for those of us practicing this, recognize it's really difficult, it's really important. Otherwise, we're just a, a, a subsidiary of the state courts and um, we need to be very careful about how we um, elevate and bring our values into our systems. So, the United States application of parental rights and some of the other things need to be interpreted through tribal law. We don't have to accept them completely. We have a right to interpret them under tribal law. So I highly encourage us to consider what our family values are as reflected through our tribal practices and customs. Um, the second one is treatment of families. So even though our codes might look like states, um, we don't treat families often in the way that state courts do. So some state courts have closed court and, um, uh, you know, 
they are very high, uh, they, they withhold a lot of information from the extended family about the case. And then I noticed in our tribal courts, we're all very different, but some are much more open into bringing the family into the court without getting so um, uh, scared of rules like HIPAA, et cetera. Not that I'm saying that HIPAA doesn't apply. It may, it might, <laughs> but we have a right to, in, to write that into our codes and in our orders as to why we made decisions. So I just think um, our values have much better chance of being elevated and included in a tribal court. Proximity. So when I was a state court prosecutor in a very big jurisdiction, I could prosecute somebody and put them in jail and you know, I could run into them never. I, you know, I rarely ran into my witnesses, their family members, et cetera, out in the world. So it was a distance and um, a sense of justice, right? Because I was separated from them. Tribal court, not the same, right? So as a prosecutor, I, you know, I'd have a family in criminal court, I'd have them in all these other courts. And then the same day, that father might hold open the door for me and say, good morning, Miss Fremont, right? And I know where he lives. I drive by his house all the time. I can see him, good, bad, and ugly, but I can see the good in him. I can see him hold his baby out in the natural world. We have connection to our families that does not happen in state courts very often. Our judges do not, state court judges, do not have that kind of proximity to the families that we deal with. Maybe similarly situated families, maybe, but I suggest probably not. Most of the people that I engage with don't understand what it is to be poor, to be a fourth generation of significant trauma, to be third generation, second generation of serious substance abuse, recovering from all kinds of abuse, uh, but still a family. That kind of compassion is often missing in the state court system that we have the ability to bring forth. It does not mean we don't wanna change and treat behaviors. It doesn't mean we don't wanna change and treat behaviors, but we don't have the compassion in the state courts that we have the ability to um, have the emotional connection and proximity in tribal courts. We can do that. And we don't need to get as, um, again, uh, I don't like this word, but I'm gonna use it colonized or assimilated into state law ethics about what we see and how we engage, right? We need to be really intentional about that. Um, we are different. We are different and we can be reflective and ethical in our own way. Next. So I'm gonna bring us back around um, removal. Why do we remove in tribal courts? For those of you who practice direct tribal welfare, what is our standard for removal? So under ICWA, the state is supposed to do active efforts to avoid removal. What can you do? What kind of safety can we do to not? We're gonna again talk about this a little bit later. A lot of times that's based on what we had the capacity to do as a government, um, or as a department. Um, so what could we do to, to prevent removal, to not have removal? And I think that our strongest piece here in tribal communities is our natural resource of a family. Oh, I know families are mad at their relatives. I know that they're tired of it. I know that they're sick of it. And I know they just want the negative behaviors to stop. I know that. But typically, we have to dig deep into that resource as to how to keep that family together. Um, I see a lot of communities Sometimes we're not even our own CPS workers. Sometimes it's BIA and sometimes it's um, state workers. A lot of them is take now, ask questions later. And I think, um, is that the principle of ICWA? No. And would it ever be the principle of a tribe if we really dealt down into it? I don't think so. Um, I like to ask us often, and I think we should ask our tribal community members, what would we do if we didn't have CPS? How would we have kept that child safe? What would we have done? What if we couldn't call the hotline? How would we have kept that family safe? How do we um, allow for that, right? I think most of us know the answer to that, right? Um, we go be aunties and it's not fun and it's exhausting and we're tired, but 
we have to um, find ways with love and compassion to help bring some of our natural resources to the top. Placements. It's without a doubt in most tribal courts that of course we're putting these with family. Um, of course we are. Um, so I would, I would challenge us to not get lost into the ideas of some of the state statutes. Yes, we need funding. I'm acknowledging we need funding and sometimes we are stuck with that, but really working hard to recognize that placement is um, critical for the family and to keep together. One of the most detrimental peace practices we've picked up from, in my opinion, is prohibiting parents from having any contact with the placement. Uh, uh, we've learned a lot about this from research, but I'd say our gut tells us this too. Yeah, we don't, we don't want violence around our kids, right? But for the, anybody of you, if we were in person, I'd ask this in a different way, but um, I think all of us know, if we didn't have them ourselves, we know people who were, uh, whose parents were addicts or alcoholics. Maybe they weren't able to raise them, but they loved them. They might be angry. They might be a little, you know, they might have their own trauma from, but they loved them. And they wanted to see them, even if it wasn't very much just to know who they were. So when we do these absolute bars, we cannot hold the children as carrots for behavior that is not a tribal value. We need to remember that children wanna know who their parents are, even if they're sick, even if they have their issues. We need to really think about, is it really unsafe to have any of those contacts? Um, we'll talk again more about that this afternoon. Legal permanency. Hmm. I was raised in an extended family. The people who raised me when my father was shipped overseas did not have legal custody of me. The people who raised me um, that could discipline me to teach me about how to be a young woman did not have paperwork to tell them that. And we don't need paperwork until the state tells us we need it, right? So we put all these weird formalities around what it means to be a family. So. We need to be really cognizant about, yes, we wanna close cases. We want people to not have to come to court anymore, but we also wanna know, how's this family just gonna be a family and not be so focused on the, uh, the, the boxes that we wanna check. We've, the boxes I wanna check is how is this family gonna be a safe family? How's this family gonna get well? And do they need us? Is it our role anymore or not? Yes, I know people need things like um, authority to register a child for school, authority to get the child medical treatment, but, and we can handle those, but we don't need to worry that it has to go all the way to full adoption because sometimes um, those kind of things are too complicated emotionally for generations to get to. And so we need to calm down a little bit about that in my opinion. And remember, we've always raised in community. We can make that happen. Um, I know it's a lot of work. And the last one is active efforts. So under the state view, when the government comes in, when the government comes into your home and tells you how to parent, right? Um, they said, well, that's so important that we need to, before we do that, we need to have a way that we're gonna make it better for tribal families. Maybe tribes feel the same, maybe not. Maybe they don't feel like it's the government's job to fix that. Maybe they think it's the extended family's job to fix that. We shouldn't automatically presume, because I think this is where we get a little misfiring. How many of you, if you're on your own tribal page for Facebook or Twitter or whatever, um, have seen families, I'm just gonna put out my two tribes, um, or people complaining about all the things the tribe doesn't do for them. <laughs> how many times like why isn't this check here why is housing this why is this why is this right and uh well we got forced into that we got put on reservations right so we we were not really allowed to figure out how to maintain ourselves so we, they said so they've created this but family doesn't have to be same family doesn't have to be the same so we need to find ways and i know we're going to hear about from these other courts in which we want to empower or recognize or lift up the family's right to one another and their right to be engaged here. To me, that's the active efforts. Yes, we might have some duty on behalf of the tribe, 
because we things like mental health and treatment, we need to engage family members to be good relatives. We need extended family. This is who we are. So um, that's what the state courts are trying to do. And they learned that from us. So we should be working it as much as we can too. But oh, it's hard. I just want to emphasize it's hard. I've been extended kin caregivers for some of my relatives who struggle with addiction and it's painful. It's painful, it's heartbreaking. Um, and I don't always have the energy to do it. I'll be you know, quite honest, like I, it, sometimes you don't have it. So it has to go to others, but it's hard, but that's who we are. And unfortunately that's the world we live in. Next slide, I know we're running out of time. Oh, that's the end of it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit later this afternoon about um, safety decisions in the tribal court, um, or maybe even in the state court in general, like when are we making state safety decisions? But one question that I um, like to leave with or have us think about in the, in the, as we go forward is, um, we learned this idea about child saving everywhere, right? So child saving, yes, children are sacred, children are our future, children are all of us, right? But where did we lose the idea that we have to help the whole family? Where, where did that value come from? And is it, a, is it a white value of individualism? So, you know, everybody campaigns on saving the children, <laughs> but, but will we walk away if it means saving the family and helping the parents? Is that the work we're ready to do? So I'd love us to talk about that this afternoon. So that's me, um, that's my piece. So uh, I'll turn it back over to our host. Thank you. Thank you, Jack and Sherry. Um, that was that was great. We have a few um, questions in the chat box um, and a few comments that um, I think we should we should vocalize. Um, Jack, do you want to touch on tribal licensing um, for foster parents at all? Well, just that that um, you know, tr many tribes license their own foster parents. Um, they fund them through a variety of, of mechanisms. Some of them fund them through Title IV e directly from the federal government or through tribal state agreements. Some of them fund them with TANF payments. Sometimes there's BIA um, uh, assistance that can be provided uh, uh, through the Bureau. Um, so there are a lot of ways that tribe, and obviously uh, tribal funds, if the tribe has its own funds. So there's a lot of ways that tribes can fund those families directly. Um, we also know a lot of, uh, a lot of tribes, uh, families get custody outside the child welfare system, either informally or sometimes through a private guardianship proceeding through tribal courts. Uh, they generally don't get, uh, funded, but they can still get a lot of tribal support through services and other things if the tribe is prepared to offer that. Um, and then if states... Well, uh, states are supposed to use tribally uh, licensed homes as a preferred equip placement. And so if a tribal home is available and if a state places a child in that home, then the state should be paying that family. Now, obviously the tribe needs to agree to that. The family needs to agree to that. You need to figure out how that family is going to be supervised because uh, the family may not want this, may want tribal uh, supervision as opposed to state supervision. So those are details you may need to work out. But, uh, but there are a lot of, so there are a lot of different ways that, that um, uh, tribal uh, homes can be funded. And it, it just depends on, you know, what's available to any particular tribe. Oh, I would add, um, so the state codes, the state licensing practices can, you know, it's better used almost always when we can use the tribal practices of licensing. But the assessments that they use are not very, uh, often um, culturally sensitive when you can. And the main thing about becoming licensed is typically when you become licensed, it's not child specific. And so that's a strange piece we found. We did a, um, we did a research project with Casey and several tribes and states for a couple of years. And we found that most families who um, take in a child, most people only want to take in their relatives. They don't really want to be in the system and take any child that needs placement. Some do, and, and yeah, that's amazing. But the, the most people just are interested in taking care of their relatives and they need some help. And so um, 
it's complicated and um, and then we ran into many people who don't feel appropriate taking state money to take care of their relatives because they felt like they had a duty to that child and then um, they just make it work. So there's a lot of different concepts out there, but funding is the main piece. Um, our families are struggling and financially struggling and to have a second, a new child in the home with daycare needs and food needs and clothes needs, it, it's hard. And so I, unfortunately, I just wish it wasn't attached to uh, these weird words like licensing when they really just wanna take care of relatives. Thank you. Um, and I just, I want to add that we we're open for Q&A. If anybody has any more questions, you can just feel free to type them in the chat box um, and we can address those. We'll give you a few more minutes. One uh, question or resource I would like to see is if anybody has um, an, either a, a written policy or in code as to the considerations that a tribe has before transfer. Um, we get asked a lot about um, how to how to write that or what to consider. And um, so it's just something, sometimes there's committees that choose whether or not to bring a tribe back, I mean, a case into tribal community. Um, so if anybody has anything um, useful or that they think is worth sharing, I'd love to hear about that too. We have this comment from Trace Rayburn about uh, children's code development. Um, Sherry, could you touch on, on the development of codes and do you have any advice that you wanna share? Oh gosh, um, children's code writing is uh, really hard. All code writing is, hard. well, no, not all of it. Um, but you know, how are you going to catch, one of the things we're doing in state courts is right now is um, we're working with some group communities on what is neglect? How is it understood? Are we giving ourselves authority to things we just don't like? Um, are we mandate, who are we mandating? Who, who do we have jurisdiction over? So I'm a big fan of the idea of digging deep into values and not, and it's so hard to not look at the state systems. It's so hard. Um, be, and, and I think we work with a lot of lawyers who don't well understand how the application of ICRA works. And um, it's very easy to fall into the idea that, um, yeah, the state, the United States constitution is gonna have application. Um, I always push back on that a little bit because if you look and see as to which, how many of our cases actually get brought into federal court for review, it's relatively few and it's not as tight as we think. And so I think we need to look at it. Um, I, there's a, we visited a community in uh, way North Alaska and looked at their code and they actually talk about love. And I've seen some other communities that talk about love. It's a lot of work. Um, and I think Val does the best with it. Um, but what I recommend is please don't emulate the states. The United States of America has more children in care than anywhere else. We are out of control with trying to control the way families are. Yes, we all want safe kids, but the involuntary process of the court system fails. Dragging families into court fails children and families almost always. And that's hard for me as someone who did it directly for 15 years to come to terms with. It might keep a few, it might keep them a little bit safer, but the overall harm that we ultimately do is, is very difficult to process. And so I'm looking at these other types of um, courts that you're gonna hear about. And when we look at codes, I really think we start, we have to start from the lens of honestly, from the land and the child up, right, and, and out, and not parent to child. We, that, that we need to resist that first and foremost, that it's only a parent's right to their child. I think that'll do us um, ongoing harm, and so we really need to just scrap it all and, and talk about what are we doing and what do we hope we really are going to achieve. I don't even know if that helps. <laughs> And, and, and let me just let me just add another thought because I know that sometimes people say, "Well, that's all well and good, but we we want to get Title IV funds and we want to do this, we want to do that, and so don't we have to do all of these things in our code?" And, and one thing that that I think people don't realize is that almost all the really important things that you want to do in your system are not dictated by any of these federal federal laws. 
what, under what circumstances are you going to remove a child? What kinds of supports and services are you going to provide to that child and family? Um, are you going to terminate parental rights ever? If you are, what are the, the, the limited circumstances you want to do that? And uh, you know, how, how, where are you going to put your kids if they can't, if, if you have to remove them for safety? All of that is totally within the power of the tribe, whether or not you're running these programs or not. And sometimes I think people think that these programs tie their hands in a whole lot of ways that they really don't. So, so I would urge you not to somehow get fooled into the idea, oh, we can't do it that way because, because you usually can. And you and you ha and you need to. I agree with Sherry. Your codes need to reflect your values first and foremost. And there are ways to even shoehorn some things you might need to do to get funding in a way that doesn't conflict with your values. It's not always easy, and a lot of the people who work on your codes don't fully understand all of that, which is problematic. But I just want to tell you, it, it is doable. I think um, I've been guilty of this. I've had to work on it a lot. Um, most of us, I don't know, some of us are frustrated. We want better lives for our kids and families. We want things to look better for our babies, our kids. We want that. And we're out of ideas and nothing seems to work. And so we want a quick fix. We want it to stop. And we think that everybody thinks like we do and that they would make the same choices that we do. And so the brain science piece is critical to understand multi-generational trauma. Um, all of these things have to be considered when we talk about how we're gonna make rules um, because the same rules aren't gonna be able to be met by everybody. And we need to understand um, how are we gonna use our systems to develop over generations because it's not gonna happen in a year and we have a lot to heal from. So, um, just recognizing that a code isn't going to fix it, a uh, the most amazing child welfare director isn't going to fix it, the best judge isn't going to fix it. It's all of us sharing and, and coming together around our values and goals. I guess my timer's still on time. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Sherry and Jack, um, for that presentation. And um, that gave us a lot to think about for the coming couple of days. Um, and unfortunately, we're out of time for now. Um, we'll take a 30 minute break um, and we'll resume the sessions at 11 Mountain Time. Um, and don't forget to tag Nija 2020 for, um, for door prizes if you're interested in winning one of those door prizes. So we'll just take a 30 minute break and we'll see everybody at 11. child welfare judicial skills training. We're happy to have you back for the session best practices for a child welfare docket during COVID-19. 
So today we are going to have a um, presentation by Elton Naswood and a facilitated discussion with Judge Shannon Prescott. Elton Naswood is originally from Whitehorse Lake, New Mexico, and he grew up in Window Rock, Arizona on the Navajo Reservation. He resides in Denver, Colorado. Mr. Naswood is currently a program coordinator at the National American Indian Court Judges Association. Prior to joining NIJA, he was a senior program analyst in the Capacity Building Division at the Office of Minority Health Resource Center with the Office of Minority Health and the US Health and Human Services Department. He provided health education training and capacity building assistance that included grant writing trainings and resource development and tribal health programs. Shannon Prescott is a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation and has dedicated her legal career to the practice of Indian law. She received a BS in criminal justice from Northeastern State University and a Juris Doctorate from the University of Tulsa College of Law. She currently serves as the district judge of the Muscogee Creek Nation Family Law Division, and she's also the district judge of the Delaware Nation. So that being said, uh, I would love to welcome Elton Naswood and Judge Prescott, and feel free to also um, provide your own welcomes and introductions as well. Thank you, Elton. Thank you, Judge Prescott, for being here. Thank you. All right. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, being here and for participating in our trial welfare training. Uh, as Nikki had mentioned, uh, my name is Elton Noswood. I am a member of the Navajo Nation. I am near to the Water Clan, born for the Edge Water Clan. Uh, my maternal grandfather's clans of the Mexican people and my paternal grandfather's clans of the Tango people. This is how I identify as Navajo. So we wanted to share this session to talk about actually the times we're living in right now uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So um, as part of the first part of this presentation, <clears throat> with my public health background, I'm just going to review some uh, issues around COVID-19 um, as a virus um, and as ways that we can protect ourselves to kind of set a foundation for uh, the second part of this presentation, which is more of a facilitated discussion uh, with Judge Prescott around how her court has been able to adapt to uh, these times. So with that said, we will go ahead and begin. So as you all know, um, we have been uh, dealing with this uh, coronavirus disease, which is also called COVID-19 since um, around about earlier this year. Uh, the COVID-19 is a respiratory illness caused by novel coronavirus that was first detected in China uh, um, late last year in December 2019. And since that time, the virus has spread throughout the countries, uh, throughout the world, which also includes the United States. Um, you know, this is a fairly new virus, and so a lot of the information has been involved, has, has began to evolve daily, um, and so we're still learning about this virus as well. How the virus is spread. <clears throat> so early on, um, we, you know, it was known that the virus was um, contractible through uh, droplets um, and affects our respiratory system. And it uh, um, actually is easily spread from person to person uh, when we're in close contact within about six feet or less. Uh, the droplets are produced uh, by the infected person and can be passed on through coughing, sneezing, breathing, singing, and talking. Uh, and the droplets also have, have, have been found to inf uh, infect uh, individuals when it's inhaled and deposited on mucous membranes, those of which are lined within our nostrils as well as our mouth. Uh, so people who are infected um, so people who are infected but do not have symptoms can also spread the disease. This is what we've been hearing nationally on the news as asymptomatic individuals. Um, and under, cer circum cer <clears throat> under cer certain circumstances, for example, um, it's easily spread through spaces that don't have uh, large ventilations. And so we've seen, in, um, we've seen situations where um, Activities are held outdoors, whether it's uh, eating in a restaurant, 
Um, you know, there are some religious um, um, services that are held outdoors as well and a numerous events, um, but that allows for more of the ventilation. Um, so then the airborne, um, the virus is not spread. So ways to protect yourself. So we've been hearing this constantly uh, throughout the media and you know through public health campaigns, but these are three ways that have really helped to significantly stop the spread of the virus. And one of them is about wearing a mask. Uh, wearing a mask to cover your mouth and your nos nose uh, helps in spreading the disease. Wearing a mask in public places is really important at transportations, at events and gatherings, um, or when you're around other people. Um, and I know there has, some be has been some debate throughout the country about the use of wearing masks. And interesting enough, as Native people, I've heard that, you know, it's a part of our cultural practices. So when we do, you know, some of our ceremonies involve wearing masks. Um, and all of these reasons are for our protection. So when we take a cultural perspective on wearing a mask, it seems very um, significant and easier for our, uh, us as Native people to be able to wear our masks so we can protect our communities, our relatives, and our friends. And another way to protect ourselves is to wash our hands often uh, with soap and water for about 20 seconds. Um, you know, I've been doing that and I've been singing some of these uh, little songs that I learned as a child, which is more than 20 seconds, but that helps me in terms of, um, um, you know, being able to wash any droplets that may have been on my hands um, and helps to stop the spread. And then, um, you know, my meat, one of my nieces as well has mentioned to me, she's like, uncle, just don't touch your face. And I kind of looked at her and I thought, well, that's some good advice too, because, you know, the transmission of the virus does happen through um, our nostrils and our mouth and even our eyes. Um, so it's really important that we wash our hands often in doing that. Um, and then also social distancing, which is to remain about six feet from other people uh, who may be sick, sick and others in your household as well. And then cleaning and disinfecting is also important. So it's really important to clean and disinfect frequently touched surfaces daily, which may include tables, doorknobs, light switches, countertops, handles, surfaces, um, judges gavels, those type of thing. Uh, it's really important to be able to disinfect it. Um, if the surfaces are dirty, clean them, use detergent, or soap and water prior to disinfections. And then also use household disinfectant that are most commonly EPA registered household uh, disinfectants, external um, icon that will work as well. So Lysol, um, bleach, Clorox, all those type of household disinfectants will help as well. And I say this because when we're continuing to be able to be uh, you know, to utilize our court systems or when we do have individuals who come into courts for those courts that are open, it's really important that there's a cleaning mechanism to be able to do that so everyone feels safe as well. And I just wanted to give an overview <clears throat> of kind of some statistics that have affected our, uh, uh, our Native communities. And these statistics come from the Indian Health Services. And this particular slide, um, is reflective of data through December 5th, so fairly recent. And they try to update this data as often as they can. And if you can see these slides, these are based upon Indian Health Services area, um, area designations. Um, we see there's tested individuals from those tests, how many of them came back COVID positive, how many are COVID negative, and the actual com um, cumulative percentage of positivity for those tests that were conducted. And if we can look at the area you may be from, it's really significant to see how many people were tested, but also significant to see how many people um, were COVID positive. And some of the highest rates is within the Oklahoma City area with almost 30,000 positivity rates um, from COVID. And then the next being the Navajo area with almost 20,000 or about 19,408. Um, and then the Phoenix area with approximately almost 15,000. So as you can see, we really have, you know, the virus has really impacted our communities detrimentally. 
And the work that I do in public health when we talk about data is that, yes, the numbers are significant, particularly with the COVID-19 um, virus, but then also in our own minds as Native people, we expand that thought process is to think, wow, this is family members, these are relatives, these are elders, these are our knowledge keepers. And if one, one person is affected by this disease and may have passed on because, because of the disease, we lose a lot of our native history, our native stories, our native language, our native way of life. So when we think of data in that way, it's really imperative to think how detrimental this virus has impacted our communities as well. Uh, but on the hindsight of that, you know, it's really important to see how many people are getting tested. And so people who are getting tested are either diagnosed as uh, being COVID positive, but then a lot more are being diagnosed as uh, COVID negative. And it's really important that we continue to have individuals tested um, on that level as well. And this is just the map I wanted to show of the United States and how it has impacted our communities based, up, um, based upon uh, the IHS areas. As, as you can see, the red uh, dots or the red states that we see here are the ones with a, a higher rate of uh, COVID positive cases. So we see Oklahoma, um, Nebraska, oh, not Nebraska, what's above Oklahoma there? Kansas. Kansas. I believe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. The map is a little, um, you know, and we see a lot of the places on the west and the north and then our relatives uh, to the north in Alaska has um, have been impacted as well. So there are a number of things that ha are happening in Indian country in regards to the COVID pandemic, but it's really important to remind ourselves of the basic understandings um, of keeping ourselves safe and then also translate that public health messages in the courts operations if they want to be in person, but also to continue to remind our communities on how not to be able to spread the COVID-19 disease. And these, and then I also wanted to share a couple of resources. Um, I did get the slides and the information primarily from the CDC. Uh, .gov website on COVID-19, as well as Indian Health Services. But these are additional um, resources if your court would like to look for um, additional um, information around COVID-19. Uh, NIJA, we do have a COVID-19 resources for tribal courts. Um, and earlier during the epidemic, we held uh, rapid response webinars um, almost weekly on issues on how tribal courts are dealing with COVID-19. Um, so those are on our websites and you can actually access the webinars as well um, on different topics. And then uh, also the National Council of Juvenile Fam Family Court Judges Association do, does have a resource and update page as well. Um, Tribal Law and Policy Institute has an Indian Country COVID-19 co coronavirus response page, resources page as well. And then Nationally, the National Indian Health Board has a COVID-19 page as well where you can access. So there are a number of resources that your court or your programs can access to gain more information um, <clears throat> and discussing implement, safe ways of implementing and continuing your courts as well. And we just wanted to share that with you today and just to kind of remind everyone on how this epidemic has affected, um, affected our tribal communities. Now we're really excited today to have Judge Pescott uh, take some time out of her, um, of her day to share with us some of the successes and challenges as well as some of the implementation um, strategies that they've utilized, particularly at the Muscogee Creek Nation uh, Court on dealing, with, um, on dealing with cases and continuing cases um, during this pandemic. And so these are just a couple of questions we're gonna ask Judge Pescott about and hopefully have a good discussion on how they've been able to do that and also give some advice on how you can continue uh, your juvenile courts uh, within your communities as well. So thank you for being here, Judge Prescott. Um, thank you. We're, yes, we're really excited to hear what you all have done and um, hopefully some ideas will come and um, be utilized by others who are joining this webinar today. Uh, so the first question I wanna ask you is, how has your court adjusted juvenile court proceedings virtually during the COVID pandemic? 
And also, how are these services being provided during COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic as well? Okay, so I just kind of wanted to start off with um, initially when everything started getting shut down, we were within a few days of a jury term and it was going to be a juvenile um, jury term, which I think everybody can understand. You wait a while to finally have a jury term. You're at that point where you're ready to move a case forward for permanency and then we have the shutdown. So um, our first reaction was quite honestly, uh, disbelief. Um, I don't think in any of our lifetimes that we ever uh, faced a situation where we were in complete shutdown. We couldn't go to, to stores or you know anything. And so I think initially um, we had to take a step back. I've worked for the nation in some capacity for more than 20 years. So I'm very familiar with what we have to offer, where our services are located. So we just began a plan of action. Um, how are we going to keep moving these cases along. Most cases, um, whether it be family law or um, civil cases, they can be slowed down. They can take a few months to get into court and be fine. Um, but our juvenile cases, we must keep moving, especially with our delinquent work. Um, those cases, you know, we have detention reviews that must be done, you know, within a time frame. So we had to figure out pretty quickly how we were going to make that happen. I do want to say that our, our nation has done a fantastic job in its response to the, the pandemic. We shut down immediately in March. And to be quite honest, we've not reopened yet at all. Um, that doesn't mean that services aren't being provided. It's just, you can't come on the complex. We're trying to keep a safe environment, healthy environment so the citizens can still get the services they need, albeit in a different way. So what I've done from the juvenile side is we originally were doing um, some in-person, those that didn't feel comfortable allow them to have virtual hearings. So we use two different platforms um, right now, and we're actually able to use any platform that we want, would like, but we use BlueJeans, which is an app that is approved by the Oklahoma Supreme Court for all court systems within Oklahoma. And as you pointed out, we're in the red area. Uh, we're one of the states that unfortunately our case numbers are high. And so they, they picked this um, platform for us to utilize. And it's worked well in most ways. Um, we utilize Zoom. Uh, we've had to do that with some of our facilities that hold juveniles. Um, that would be the only platform that they could utilize. So we've had to set it up on our uh, computers. Uh, we had the majority of the equipment. We're pretty fortunate that we had a pretty technologically advanced courtroom where we already had cameras. We had recording systems. Um, one of the things that we did adjust within the courtroom is we put up a lot of plexiglass. Quite honestly, I feel like I'm in a zoo sometimes or a museum behind plastic, but um, we have that between my court reporter, we have it in the courtroom, between the parties. Um, so it, it almost looks like a one of those mirror mazes that you kind of walk through to get in, but we do our best to kind of keep people separated when you have to have in-person. So the majority of our juvenile cases have not been delayed. Uh, we've been able to um, set those up virtually and handle our cases as needed. Now, I will say some of the, um, the manners in which we provide our services has differed. Um, I know that some of the classes they've had to quit the in-person, do more of those virtually. Um, but so far, I haven't seen much um, being completely shut down where you're not having access to it all. I know that there was initially maybe 30 to 45 days where we had a tough time um, figuring out the best way to do it. But ultimately, I've just been very impressed with the response of our um, administration to our needs and our, you know, those things that would help us feel comfortable doing court. We are currently back into phase one, unfortunately, where nobody enters the courtroom, um, but all the counties around us that have court, all those um, districts have also shut down completely. So um, I think we are way ahead from being within 11 counties. Um, I, I think we are leaps and bounds ahead of most court systems because we've been doing virtual the entirety of this time. So I will, I want to throw this in there because it sounds like, wow, they had everything they had, they needed at their fingertips. They're lucky. We're not like that. But let me tell you, during all this pandemic, we also had the infamous McGirt case happened. And so we had to deal with numbers increasing. So we went from smaller caseloads dealing with the pandemic to a large amount of cases coming in. So We've had the pandemic and McGirt, um, which I'm not going to say it's quite like a pandemic, but it definitely has caused a lot of changes for our court system. And so I think we are leaps and bounds ahead of most of our areas. So that's just kind of in general what we've done to continue those proceedings. 
Great. Um, and thank you for giving an overview on how you've been able to do that. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, your caseload is probably a little bit higher as well with that decision. So that has added, you know, some extra um, work for you all there at the court. Um, right. So the next question would be, what has, what have been some barriers and challenges that your court has experienced in providing these services? The number one barrier is that we're in a very rural area. Um, internet is sporadic. I mean, I live out, um, I live on the reservation, but closer to a more rural area and internet is sparse. And so we've found some challenges with our citizens being able to utilize that virtually um, to join those calls. I mean, we all are familiar with the, those platforms, Zoom and BlueJeans, where you can use the, just the phone side of it. But even then, phone service was kind of spotty. So that has been a barrier. Um, and we'll talk some more about how we've overcome some of those. But I mean, that's been one. Um, transportation is always an issue. So when we tell people, hey, if you can't do it from your house, go into town or use it while you're in town. Well, again, transportation is an issue with our citizens. So that's been problematic too. Um, I would say probably one of the biggest challenges is kind of not being afraid and not um, getting so wrapped up in the pandemic and how are we going to do this? I think we had to get out of our own heads and figure out the best way um, to, to make things successful. And, and I, I, I say this, I mean, I said this from the beginning when we started these um, little talks about how we were going to prepare. Honestly, I looked at this as a positive. I mean, I know that pandemics are horrible and we've lost a lot of people and a lot of our citizens, but I had to look at this as a positive or probably would have gone a little crazy during all of it, but to figure out what can we do to have those best practices and how what things could we change? And so although that was a barrier and a challenge to overcome, just kind of our own fears and um, concerns, I think it's actually benefited the way we're running our court system now. I think it's really opened that up. Great, great. So taking more of it a positive approach on how to continue to provide those services has been a best practice yes. um, as well, which kind of leads into the next question in terms of best practices and strategies. Um, what has the court done to help to assist with these services um, um, you know, that has worked for you and that you may want to suggest to others? I think um, keeping your dockets consistent. Uh, we have found, um, that especially in juvenile deprived or those um, dependency cases, the families are very nervous when they come into the courtroom. And it's almost, you know, even though you try to make it less adversarial, being in a courtroom is adversarial. Just in the, you know, watching TV, that's the kind of thought you have or takeaway that you have from watching that. One of the best things that I found is that giving that flexibility to appear virtually has actually calmed people. I was surprised that during our process, it's almost less adversarial. I feel like I'm talking to them. I'm not in a robe sometimes, you know, I mean, like right now. Um, and I felt like they had an opportunity to be heard and they were more relaxed in their own setting. So I felt like that might be something that we consider, whether it be from the judge's perspective, even the courtroom, leave the bench, set with everyone and have those conversations. Because when I start a case, a juvenile deprived matter, I served as a former prosecutor for the nation. So I've served in a different capacity, whether representing parents, prosecuting those cases, and now as a judge. And if people don't feel like you're on their side, you've already set them up to fail. And I felt like this is a good practice for us to look at this as a less adversarial, um, case, especially the early stages, so that we can work um, with the families. If they feel like I'm up there just, quote unquote, judging them, uh, they're going to be very nervous. And so I think a best practice is really, that's helped me understand that, you know, everybody has their role, but we're a team. And if we want them to be successful, the team needs to be on their side. So I think we need to start looking at that, um, allowing them to appear virtually if necessary. If they, and, and, and I kind of want to, um, bounce off of that, we expect a lot from these families. And I look at that and I think I have every resource at my fingertips. I work, I have a spouse, I have, you know, all the support system, and I don't know if I could complete that plan. And so what can we do to make it easier for them? 
And I think if you can say, hey, stay at work, but on your lunch break, join us for court and let's talk about how you're doing. And I do think that we need to consider that in some of our cases. So I think that's the best practice overall, regardless of pandemic or otherwise, that we look at that. Um, I also think making sure that we, this gave me an opportunity to get forms in order that we had not had a chance to do. Adjudication forms, uh, disposition for our treatment plan forms, getting those orders prepared. And so we've started that. Um, I've prepared those forms. We've been able to finalize minute orders. Um, so, I mean, I, I think right now it's really worked for us um, in a positive way. Like I said, I try to pull a positive out as much as I can, but keeping that risk low um, as much as we can. So just looking at different options. Um, I also think um, when we're working with our services, it has helped if, um, if they can do a service um, virtually rather than go in, in person. I, I think the only limitations I would have with that are serious domestic violence situations where that may be their only opportunity to get out of the home if they're still with the abuser um, and making sure that they have safe ways of participating virtually. That would really be my only concern, but otherwise it seems to be working for us and making it less adversarial during all this. Okay, I'm sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. Uh, thank you for providing some of those strategies, you know, redoing, you know, some of your doc, docket forms, um, you know, being able to do um, services that are virtual are really important. Um, <clears throat> are there any successes that you've seen through being able to provide and adapting these proceedings of services? Well, and I think, like I said, we're kind of leaps and bounds ahead because when the courts have been shut down, they shut down dockets altogether. And we've been able to continue to move our families forward. Um, this kind of falls within a success and a best practice, but um, rather than wait 90 days for a review, if things are going well in a case, we've been able to just email each other and then they'll sit, submit it to me saying, hey, we all agree it's time to move into unsupervised visitations or we're ready for trial reunification or ready for these different things. And so we um, have been able to do that without even addressing it in court. So I think it's actually streamlined our process and helped our families move forward rather than waiting until the next review period to determine um, you know, if they're ready to move forward. So we, we, I feel like it's, it's a success if you can move a case forward and into trial reunification and get permanency for children. And so instead of waiting or being delayed because of the pandemic or otherwise, um, you know, getting those cases moving forward. I, I also think, you know, this is, this is one thing that was a barrier initially too, but we've kind of figured out a way, visitation. Um, you have children in foster homes, leaving the foster home, going somewhere or having the parents come into the home and that that um, concern about you know exposing each other to the virus and so initially we thought no visits well then that's just really not what we you know the best way to handle that for these children they need to be able to see their parents so we set up and provided um, whether it be an iPad or otherwise our, our, our tribe or gave out monies to get those virtual things um, whether it be iPads or um, tablets or otherwise, so that we could do visits um, via Zoom. Not the best, but initially when we were very concerned about contamination and bringing kids in and out, that seemed to work. So they've set up Zoom conferences, Zoom meetings, allowing them to see their children, um, and then finding a, a clean place that's been sanitized, allow the parents to come in, check their temperature, um, do different things so that we can allow them to have contact with their children. So I think that's been a success. At first, we had to slam on the brakes and think, no, no, no contact. But we tried to figure out the best way to do that. Um, that could be safe for everyone, but still maintain that contact with their children. So, um, I mean, overall, I think we've done a really good job in maintaining safety as much as we can. And, and I'm not going to lie, we've still had exposures. I've been tested a number of times just in case. Um, but I think we've done the best that we could in the situation at this point. Great, great. <clears throat> um, and one of our other questions that we have is, how does your court address and handle confidentiality issues in juvenile cases while utilizing virtual platforms? 
so when we do a docket um, virtually, we assign individual login um, codes for each case. And those are provided directly to the parents, to the attorneys involved. And before I even start a docket, I go around and I notify or ask them to at least tell me who they are on the call. I ask them to put their name on it when they do call in or if they're joining virtually so that I know who they are. If not, I identify them by the last four digits of their phone number. Who is this calling? And I make sure we identify each and every person on the call. So I think providing individual codes for each case um, so that those are given directly to the parents and nobody else is joining that call. I do allow um, occasionally the other attorneys to continue to join so they know where we are on the docket, but of course as officers of the court, that's not a concern. Um, but otherwise I have everybody identify themselves and we keep those um, you know, secured. Now, usually I'm at the courtroom, so the courtroom is closed down. The only other parties would be my, my staff um, that would overhear anything, but I make sure that I ask everybody, where are you at? Are you in a secure location where other people can't hear you? If you are, please use headphones so that nobody can, at least they can't hear what's being said by the court. Um, but for the most part, everybody has been able to find a very quiet, secure place to um, conduct their business. Um, and I mute everyone. I control everything from the courtroom side. We record it. Um, so that I can mute if there's something going on um, in the background or and things like that. So I think it works pretty well. Um, we only email through security emails um, through the nation to the attorneys so that we don't have any issues with these reports or anything getting out to the wrong hand. So I think we've been able to button it down pretty well so that everybody can participate with, with confidence that there's not going to be any breach in confidentiality. Okay, great, great. Um, you know, and thank you for being able to um, provide that information to us, you know, in terms of how the court has adapted and continue to provide services, um, you know, around uh, juvenile issues. Uh, so at this time, we're going to have um, some significant time about 15, 20 minutes to take any questions that our participants may have. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Anzi to help join us here so we can um, um, have that question and answer session as well. Hi everyone, and feel free to type your questions in the chat box and we will make sure those are addressed. Um, I guess first we could start off with um, Judge Prescott, um, how, I wanted to ask about coordination of services with the Creek Nation. Um, how has that been affected by COVID? I think initially, um, like I said, there was about a 30, 30 to 45 days where we were just uh, trying to catch up, trying to figure out what we were going to do. I do know that they've been able to provide services virtually, whether it be um, substance abuse, um, they've been able to work with other agencies within our community to coordinate together to provide, um, if, if they don't have a safe and secure location to do that, looking for, um, coordinating with another agency in town that could assist in that. So I think they've done a really good job of being able to work with each other, um, keep each other up to task. I will say whenever we've had a positive or somebody that's been um, exposed, I know we have a policy within the nation that that person goes home, we follow the CDIC, CDC guidelines. And I think that's really helped that so we don't shut down services altogether. We were running on a skeleton crew where we alternated days for people to go and that group stayed together. So they were like their little quarantine family and they weren't at work. Then the new group came in and we did our best to kind of separate that so we could maintain our services. Again, not perfect. We've had situations where um, just recently our attorney general's office um, is completely shut down and they're working virtually. But I think just making sure everybody's prepared and has the equipment they need to work virtually, um, that's been the best way for us to, to continue to move forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I know I, I listened to um, your part of the talk about all of the precautions that your courtroom has put in place and everything. Um, so I have family in Oklahoma and I know that some of the attitudes there toward the precautions aren't always very cooperative. Um, how do you handle um, any pushback that you've received or have you experienced any pushback on those precautions? 
I hate to agree with you, but you're so right. I think, unfortunately, our numbers are high because we consider mask being some political statement that we're making. And I'll be honest with you, if it protects my family, I will wear it. I'll cover my eyes if I have to, you know, so I understand that that I mean, even within my own family, I have people that feel, oh, a mask isn't going to really help. But our court is our is our safe zone and we check you at the door. We actually have a nurse stationed at the door and we will tell them if you would like to participate in the hearing today, you must have a mask. And if they say, well, no, I don't need a mask. I can't be required to wear a mask. Well, then you can go to your car and you can uh, do that virtually. And so that's just their option. If they want to come in, they must wear their mask. Uh, they must follow our guidelines. They will be checked at the door for a temperature. And that's just the way it's going to be. It's almost like security. If you go to a courthouse, you can't just take a gun in or a knife in because you feel that you're uncomfortable and you need your protection. You don't get to do that. There's certain rules you have to follow. And ours this time is it's a mask and it's following those protocols. So we do have sanitizer available. I can't even tell. I think my perfume of the day is sanitizer because I smell alcohol like that all day long. And so it's at the door when you walk in, we make you use it, you check your temperature. So if you tell me you don't want to wear a mask, then you can go to your car and participate. And we'll make sure that you have an ability to log in. Okay, um, so we have a question in the Q&A box um, from an anonymous attendee. Um, how has the court addressed concerns of ensuring child safety when returning a child back to the parent's custody? Okay, uh, so our workers are still going out. They are maintaining that contact with the families. There is nothing that says that you can't have them walk around the home with their phone, like you're FaceTiming or doing something virtually if you couldn't get out there. But they've done their best with, we had give them the proper PPP, uh, PPE equipment to wear. Um, so they aren't just staying away from the home. If we are moving a child into a home, it's after we've completed an assessment of child safety, which is a check of the home. So I don't think that we are making those decisions just willy nilly. We're doing it as we always would have, um, just giving them the proper equipment to, to enter into the home and to look around. Okay, um, we have another question. Um, have you seen any set of facts that happened because of COVID, um, such as abuse or neglect allegations based on not adhering to the recommendations or um, children who are struggling with alternative school being at home or anything like that? Absolutely, we, and, and I would say really an increase in domestic violence um, in the home. And we've also had a number of, um, if you think about it, our children are seen by teachers more than they are their own families. And if they're not in the school, they don't have contact with people outside of the home. And so a lot of things that we were, were catching where a child is hungry, or a child is not dressed appropriately, or a child has bruises, if they're not going to the classroom, that's a lot of the times where we catch those things. So absolutely, um, we've seen an increase. Um, right now, our schools are in and out. We'll have one week where they go to school and some you know, schools aren't in at all. Um, but I do think we're missing probably a lot of that because they are at home. Um, you also had the increase in um, stress in the family household. People are losing their jobs. Um, they can't get outside of the home to do basic things that they're used to doing. And so that just heightens that safety concern, especially in an already unstable situation. So absolutely, I, I would say we've seen an increase just from the criminal side. We have a lot more um, and I have to kind of put that in perspective because we also have had the change with McGirt and the number of increasing cases, but a lot of our cases are domestic violence related because they are quarantined in the home and there's no escape basically. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen an increase in, um, I know a lot of children receive services from going to in-person school, um, like the free lunches or breakfast. Um, have you um, had to intervene or provide services in the case where they're hungry children? Absolutely, the nation's done a really good job of providing more food outsourcing than we used to. We used to just have them come to our facilities, but they're going to the communities now, having those food drives, having the families come get those um, items. But yes, we've seen an increase in that. I mean, these, a lot of our children do rely on the school um, to, to provide those free lunches and they're not getting those snacks. So our our nation has worked with the local community to provide school lunches daily still. 
they'll go take the school bus and drive around and stop in the areas where they generally would pick up kids and they can come out and grab a lunch or grab a breakfast. So we have seen an increase in the request for those types of services. Mm -hmm. um, are you aware of any other services that the Creek Nation um, provides for COVID positive families? Um, not, not specifically for COVID positive. I do know that we do have um, monies right now. We're actually doing another sweep of monies for those families that are still unemployed um, to provide. And I think if you have children, it's $5,000. If you're um, single parent or single without children, it's $3,000. So this would be, been, I think the second time we provided finances to a family. We still have our general services where you can apply for emergency funds for um, utilities, um, we have our, um, our food distribution center still available. So I can't say specific for COVID positive families, but our continuing services that we provide our citizens and now this additional financial side. I, I can tell you that there was, when the children were all sent home and we knew there would be virtual, the nation provided monies for every family that wanted to, whether they lived on the reservation or not, as long as they were a citizen, they could apply for monies to buy those, um, you know, laptops. And so we received eight hundred and fifty dollars per child mm -hmm. to go and buy those that, that type of equipment to whether it be Wi-Fi or the laptop itself to provide for those in-home services. So I think we've done a great job of responding to assist our citizens. I know there's still a lot of need out there, though. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we had a comment earlier in the chat box about um, not everyone having access to internet or computers. Um, how do you, do you have any advice on how to um, support those families that don't have internet or what other options are there that you can see? Sure, so if you do have a phone, I think everybody's aware on Zoom or any of the other apps, you can dial in rather than um, appear virtually and use that. I will have some say, I can't use my internet. Can I use my phone service? Well, if you're calling in, that is your phone service. If that is completely out of the question, we have worked with our um, children and family services to assist those families in coming somewhere safe, closer to the nation where they would have access to the phone. I've even allowed them in to a secured area within the courthouse if necessary, and I'll put them in front of a camera and they can participate quote unquote virtually even within the nation. So um, we've allowed attorneys to do that. If they can't um, find a place where they can sit and do that, then they'll come in and we'll use a conference room that we have sanitized and we'll, we have a computer set up basically in every office. Right now we have a TV in every office that if you need to have somebody appear virtually, we sanitize, put them in a secure area and utilize it that way. So we found as creative as we could be um, to allow them. We just make sure if they're on the phone and we don't see them, we have them identify themselves. We make sure somebody verifies, yes, that's their voice. We know who they are and, and move forward that way. Um, have you seen an increase in truancy cases related to um, uh, lack of internet access? Um, I, yes, I mean, I have heard reports of that. Um, some of our child in need of supervision, parents were leaving, leaving the children at home. They weren't following through with what school needed them to, to work with. The good news is that a lot of our local schools is that if they have at least three days of not contacting or being on the computer and they don't have proof of that, then they contact the parents directly and say, hey, I don't know if you know this, but you may be leaving them if they're not doing their work. So they've done a good job, but um, I will say I've heard more um, reports through our child need of supervision cases of, of that being a concern. Okay, um, and we have the Q&A as the Q&A box is still open. If anybody wants to type in any more questions, comments, um, any questions for Elton as well. Um, do you have any general advice for judges and attorneys who are trying to administer justice during this time? I think just be patient. Um, keep an open mind with the mask. I mean, it's not easy. We've actually had to provide shields now so that we can see their mouths. I don't know if anybody's ever dealt with the court reporters, but they don't like it when they can't understand you. And so we've done a good job of and we also have disposable masks so that we found that if they're thinner but still provide the safety and security that we need, um, from COVID, it's easier 
people buy these homemade masks that are super thick and really aren't doing what they expect them to do. And so all they do is kind of cause issues with understanding them. So we've just worked well with um, our attorneys. If they need an emergency hearing, generally I would say come to the courthouse, bring in your documents. We really laxed our rules on allowing people to file by email, file by fax, mail things in, provide payment later if necessary. Um, we've just done as much as we can to make it as flexible um, and still give them access to justice. Um, and, and again, you know, we have worked, I'll send out emails to our local bar and say, hey, what can we do to improve? Where do you feel uncomfortable? Where do you think we can make changes and follow those suggestions as much as we can? So again, access to justice is always an, an underlying concern of mine, making sure that our citizens can get to the courthouse and if they can't, how can we make them available to participate? Okay. Well, we know that um, judges take on these, these large roles in our communities, um, but we try to stress judicial wellness uh, for the entire judi judiciary. Um, how has been handling the added stress during this pandemic um, affected you? Oh gosh, um, it's been very difficult. I am not full time on the bench. I actually am a contract. So I, you know, I'm at the nation about three days a week. I go to Delaware nation once a month and then I'm a private lawyer. So I have found that from the judicial side, I feel like I have the better control. I know what's going on. I can you know, set dockets or move dockets as needed. I've been very fortunate and I'm knocking on the wood right now, but very fortunate that my family has not been affected. My husband's a police officer. So we're in the community daily <laughs> and I have young children and then one at college. So we have had probably a lot of exposure that we weren't even aware of. So what I've done is um, if we don't have a docket, I go home to my children and I work with them and we play outside and we do things that kind of clears my mind because really the, if I can go a day without talking, it would be amazing, uh, you know, just to have that quiet. But if I'm with my children, we play outside, we live on a lot of land, we fish, it's still kind of warm right now for us. So we do everything we can to just clear our minds and leave it at, you know, where it, it should be, which is at the office. And, and like I said, with my husband being a police officer, we usually have a high level of stress. So I'm used to dealing with it, but it's it's definitely been something, like I said, none of us have ever dealt with this in our lifetime. And so I think it's just keeping a positive outlook, like I said earlier, and just doing our best to look at this as a time to have some, um, you know, fix those forms that I wanted to do or do those little tasks or do those home things that I wanted to get done. i um, spend some more time with my children. I told my husband, I said, I can't imagine any other time that I would ever have with my kids like this. Um, I have a five-year-old and a 10-year-old and once they start school, you know, you lose most of that contact. And so this is an opportunity and not just a negative. So that's how I've done that. I love that, that this is an opportunity. Um, Elton, do you have anything to add? How have you been managing, um, you know, all of this? All of this stuff that's going on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the right word, but... Well, fortunately, unfortunately, I live alone. So it's been a really big challenge. But one of the things that I experience is that I'm feeling these feelings that I've never felt before in my life and come to realize it's actually maybe depression, anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and I realized that talking to a friend of mine who is a therapist and he's given me guidance on um, what that is because I'm like I'm feeling kind of different today like I'm sleeping a lot more and and so he's given me you know advice like you know that might be onset depression you need to go outside um, mm -hmm. at least 15 to 20 minutes a day get sunlight um, you know touch a tree put your hands in the grass if it's still a, you know or touch the earth and make that connection because a lot of the times we're still you know secluded in a way to be safe but that connection with the earth is really important, uh, he has said. So I've been able to try to do that. Um, I joined a weekly support group um, virtually, um, which I was kind of, you know, as a professional, sometimes we're very afraid to give personal information. But I think since I've joined the support group, I felt a lot more comfortable in discussing some of my own personal leads. And, you know, just within the last few weeks, I really kind of had an emotional time viewing and knowing of different people who are impacted by COVID, whether it's their family members, they're being hospitalized, and then just the passing. I mean, there was a time last week where 
I was on social media and on my Facebook page, like every other comment was someone who had passed or every other comment was raising funds for funeral. And it really impacted me. And so I was able to join the support group and really felt comfortable and have gained that trust with others that are seeking the same um, same advice or same comfort during this time. So, you know, seek out support. You know, there are a number of our um, people who are um, available to help us. There are support groups, um, you know, for different people, you know, and if you are a professional, maybe find a support group that where you're um, anonymous still, where you don't have to turn on your camera, you know, that you could just speak because that release is really helpful. And then the other part of it is that I've really made more of a connection with my cultural ways. Uh, so lighting sage, offering cedar and praying. And I was telling friends of mine that I'm very blessed in that I was taught how to pray at a young age, that now that's, that it's, it, it, it's being instilled in me again to recognize those aspects that I was taught as a child. And now it's really motivated me to reach out to my own nieces and nephews and say, you know, do you know how to pray? You know, you, you know, this is how we pray. This is what grandma taught us on how to do. So kind of taking that role has really helped as well, but that cultural understanding and that cultural ways and interpreting those has really helped during this time as well. But, you know, it, you know this pandemic has affected us in different ways that we haven't experienced, but we got to realize that we're only human and being human, we have these tools that we can use of communication, of compassion, of, 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 of ceremony. So, you know, those are just a few ways that I take care of myself as well. But, you know, I think it's important that we recognize that and continue mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah, you make a lot of really great points, Elton. Thank you. Um, and on that note, I guess, are there, is anyone aware of any mentorship programs or support groups for tribal court judges specifically? Um, and if so, maybe you could type those in the chat box. Um, or Judge Prescott, if you're aware? Well, not formally. I know that if I need anything, I have a small group that I reach out to, but I don't think I, I know of anything personally that is formally set up to allow that. My mentorship has always been anything that I have is yours. If you have questions of me, whatever I can do to guide you. And, and to say that I have something formal, no, but if I will provide my information, if you have questions, if I can help you in any way, there is no pride in authorship, anything that I have is yours. And so I think just being able to say, and I think Elton, you said everything from, from recognizing those feelings, but you also said something too, which is it got you back to what really mattered. Um, and sometimes we need this most control alt delete <laughs> moment in our brains to say, what's the most important thing here? And it may be a negative thing that brought us to it, but it definitely is gonna bring us back to what's most important in our in our ways. And I think that's really important from what I gathered from him. Again, I guess I'm mispositive. I always pull something from it, but I think it's really the only way that I can sustain. So again, if anybody needs anything, wants to talk, has any concerns or questions for their court, I'm always open and I know our other judges are also. Hi everyone, um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump back into conversation as well, only because I did see that last comment about uh, mentorship programs and support groups for tribal court judges. Um, during one of our sessions during our NIJA conference, we did have a wellness session. We generally try to build wellness in um, only because we understand that, you know, working with the, in the judiciary, whether or not, and working in these child welfare cases, these are heavy, these are heavy issues. And you guys, in addition to trying to survive through a pandemic, you're still trying to administer justice and, you, you know, conduct business as usual. And we've had some lessons learned in the past eight months since we did our initial rapid response webinar. So, you know, we understand that, you know, while we are trying to work through the disruption of our systems, we're also still trying to help each other through. So um, that being said, that's a really excellent suggestion. Elton has put Lenny's contact in um, the, the bottom right there. And we have worked with Lenny before. Lenny um, assisted us with one of our wellness sessions. But, you know, this is also a really good topic for, you know, us at NIJA to follow through with um, and to maybe try to establish some of those types of um, support groups, whether it's by region or, you know, within the judiciary, 
um, nationwide, the tribal judiciary. So um, let me, we'll go ahead and follow up on, you know, that, that kind of request as well, because this is really vitally important. In order for us to take care of our communities, we have to take care of ourselves, right? Um, Ansley, there's a, another um, question in the Q&A. Um, yeah, and this is for Elton. Um, how can individuals access ceremonies um, given the social distancing requirements? Um, you know, a lot of tribal practices require gathering in person. So, um, do you have do you know of any resources that um, that connect people to deal with those issues? Uh, yeah, and that's a great question. Um, you know, obviously, it'll be different for different tribes. Um, you know, and their protocols that they have. I know some of the Lakota relatives who particularly do sun dance ceremonies during the summer um, had to either postpone it or adapt it, um, you know, as well. But again, you know, the first thing is to really think about safety for the community. Um, can these ceremonies and practices be done virtually or on the phone? Um, I know we had a roundtable um, round discussion with some, um, court personnel as well as some traditional um, practices programs earlier um, in the summer and they would have to, they mentioned that it is a little bit difficult on not being in person but the overall understanding of protecting their people was important and so they adapted talking circles um, you know but still utilize elements of the ceremony of a talking circle whether it's using a basket or a feather um, you know, but still being able to bring people together in that way. Um, it's really a challenge now, as you said, because we were taught these ceremonies of being able to be in person, but now we have to be able to adapt them. But utilizing and adapting certain aspects of ceremonies, I think is still helpful in expressing our spirituality, whether holding um, an eagle feather that you may have in your possession, whether um, utilizing water uh, in a way, and then, you know, continuously offering prayers daily daily in your own way uh, and privately, which is okay. Um, but in terms of resources, um, you know, that's really dependent on the tribe. And I know a lot of tribes have, um, you know, begin to continue to offer them, but still utilize protocols to keep people safe. Um, you know, social distancing, bringing together people outside, maybe on lawn chairs. Um, I know one thing that has been really great, at least that's, you know, you know, in terms of being connected culturally are these virtual powwows. So I know on Facebook, they have a virtual powwow group. And so people still are able to dance, you're still able to hear the songs, um, you know, together. So, you know, we've adapted in that way, but, you know, it is a difficult time and hopefully um, sometime in the future, we can gather again and being able to, you know, provide those um, ways that we were taught, so. Well, thank you, Elton. Um, and thank you, Elton and Judge Prescott for that wonderful presentation. Um, I know we had a lot of good um, questions and comments and um, thank you for, for answering all those questions. Um, so we are gonna take another 30 minute break here. We're, we're um, toward the end of our hour um, and then we'll pick it back up at 1230 Mountain Time. Um, so I think we're 1 30. Sorry. 1 30. Now we're in 30 minutes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So we're, we're going to do an hour and a half break for lunch. For some reason, I, I had that backwards in my head. Um, so we'll, we'll meet back at 1 30 mountain time. Um, and Nikki, was there anything else you wanted to announce before we break? No, um, but I did also want to extend, you know, my thanks to uh, Judge Prescott, who is always so willing to present when we ask her. I know that we, we generally keep our eye on the Creek Nation and what's happening there and their activity. And, you know, if you guys have a practice that's working well for you, you know, we're hoping that we can share that information and somebody else can pick up on some of those best practices and maybe implement it. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge so that we can, you know, provide that to um, our folks who are on this particular training. So thank you for your time again, Judge Prescott. Thank and you. of course, thank you, Elton. Um, he's always so gracious when he's um, voluntold to present. <laughs> We always, we always appreciate you, Elton, and your background. And, um, you know, like we say, 
um, generally about all these trainings, having a variety of backgrounds and a variety of perspectives really helps us as we're pulling together these types of trainings because none of these issues, whether it's child welfare, um, child abuse, neglect, um, substance use disorder for the families, none of these happen in a vacuum. Um, you know, so it's really important that we understand how it's all working together. And I um, absolutely appreciate um, Judge Prescott, your legal and judicial background and Elton, your public policy background as well and public health background as well. So um, thank you all for that. And you know, COVID and talking about COVID and how it's affecting our communities. And even if you're reflecting on how it's affecting you personally, how it's affecting your courts or your systems or your tribes personally, it's really heavy. So um, we all know that it's disrupted our lives. We know that it's disrupted businesses and that it's really affected our our tribal people disproportionately um, across the board. We understand that um, based on some of those slides that Elton showed in the beginning, that you know we are being disproportionately affected because of some of those co comorbidities um, that we are just naturally inclined to have as tribal people. Um, and that's just, um, you know, it's, it's really heavy. It's weighing on all of us. Like Elton mentioned, it's hard to see that on social media of people being personally affected, of people losing people, of seeing our elders um, become sick and losing them to the pandemic. So while we are trying to provide a lot of practical tips and trying to provide some comparative examples of how you and your tribe and your judicial systems can work through this disruption. We also wanna make sure that you're still taking care of yourselves, that you're still taking deep breaths, that you're still understanding that wellness and your wellness specifically is really important. So, you know, that being said, you know, continue to find ways to ground yourselves, continue to take those deep breaths and, you know, to reach out to us as well, because, you know, we care about all of you guys and we want to make sure that everybody's doing well, that we all make it through to the other side of this. Um, but that's not to say that we think it's all going to be, you know, sunshine and rainbows in isolation because it hasn't been. Um, and, you know, even myself, you know, I'm personally affected by the pandemic and my family in Utah and on our small reservation. And it's hard, it's really hard. It's not only just hard to you know, go through these cases, which is generally in itself really difficult, but it's hard to work through this pandemic. So that being said, let's go ahead and take this break. We've got about an hour and a half and we'll see you guys all back. We'll announce some um, door prizes and we'll collect some information, but you know, on the, the note about talking about wellness, you know, try to get outside during the break, you know, maybe take a walk. If it's cold, just go out and take a few deep breaths, try to ground yourself, you know, and to, to let go some of some of this heaviness, you know, we, um, we want you to be well, we want you to have a great lunch and we'll see you back here in about an hour and a half. So thank you everyone for um, joining us and we'll see you soon. All right, thank you everyone. <laughs> And thank you, Judge Prescott. Thank you, Elton. Thank you, Ansley. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.